اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله اشهد ان محمدا رسول الله اشهد ان محمدا رسول الله حي الله الصلاه حي الله الصلاه حي لا إله إلا الله قل أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين اياك نعبد واياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين is here for us and we bring him to this roster so that you can hear him today as clearly as those who follow him hear him bring him to the roster with takbir 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 imam rabidin muhammad الحمد لله رب العالمين let us praise be to God, Allah, in the language of our religion, the Quran and our religion, and we wish peace and the blessings and merciful blessings of God be with you all as we say assalamu alaikum. First, <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge along with acknowledging the mercy and blessings of God upon us, the hard work that you have done to make this great meeting here today possible for us in New York at this very lovely and attractive huge facility, the Jacob Javis Center. Well, I got a lot here that I would like to bring you today but I don't know how to feel comfortable without the Word of God. <clears throat> that's first and that's last. I was uh, 
riding in my car and listening to a colleague of the world, renowned man, evangelist, Billy Graham. And something caught my attention. The colleague of Dr. Graham, he said, when you kneel down to pray, you're exercising a power greater than any national leader on this earth. I thought that was great, especially, especially great to be said to the public. And he was speaking publicly in the United States of America. There are many countries where he would not be allowed to say that. He put God before man. He put God before nations. When he said that when one kneels down to pray to God, they exercise a power greater than any leader, any national leader on this earth. Also, uh, I would like to express our appreciation to the dignitaries who have joined us today. Dignitaries from our own community, imams, educators, principals, people working in government and also in the private sector. And those who come here today from the outside, from outside our community, even from outside these United States, dignitaries from the embassies here in New York, and the many others, immigrants from other countries. One joined us in Chicago and came with us, came with our senior and pioneering members. That is Sister Nusra of Pakistan, who has worked hard, faithfully among us in Chicago. She herself is an educator well-educated in Islamic knowledge and also in the secular knowledge. And she has been giving herself to our school now for several years. I was surprised when I saw her at the airport joining the others and uh, blending in so well and supporting what we are about in a way that didn't make her conspicuous at all. She's just there with us. There are many more like her who are from other ethnic backgrounds. And I think that says a lot for our new effort as people striving for righteousness true faith in God, and a true commitment to the fallen lot of our people. That says a lot for us. It says that we have changed and have not changed for the worse. We have changed for the better. In recognizing Allah, I would like to express the words of God in the Quran and the Holy Book of the Muslims. وَلِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا To Allah belongs all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth, and God is enough to settle affairs. 
يسبح لله ما في السماوات وما في الأرض له الملك وله الحمد. Whatever is in the heavens and in the earth, testify to the glory of Allah, and for Him is the rule, for Him is the praise. And God says, Allah that is says, وابتغي فيما أتاك الله دار الآخرة ولا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا and seek by the means God has given you the eternal home the end home the destiny ولا تنسى نصيبك من الدنيا however do not let the, do not neglect your share of the world. And God says, وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ بِأَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنْفُسِكُمْ And struggle, strive, not just any striving, not just any struggle, but a striving and a struggle that respects, that regards the Creator our Lord, the maker of the things that we're using to advance the struggle, a regard for that Lord in that struggle, and struggle in the path of God, and struggle in the path of God with your wealth and with your very souls. With your very souls mean put your own selves into it. Put your personal life into it. Put your energy into it. Put your concerns, your personal concerns into the path of God. Put your heart in the path of God. Put your sympathies in the path of God. Put your intellect in the path of God. Put your muscles in the path of God. Put all you have in the path of God and struggle struggle not for something that you imagine a fantasy something unreal struggle for the real things that god has directed you to on this earth in this human environment and struggle in the path of god with your wealth and with your very soul and again god says in al fitnatu akmaru min al qatl Certainly, the suppression of man's potential, of his moral potential, of his intellectual potential, of his social potential, of his political potential, the suppression of the potential in man that God has put there is a worse crime than outright slaughter. An effort or campaign for crushing the will of, of the common people or the will and spirit of the people is a bigger issue, a bigger crime than the outright killing or than killing for wealth and killing for territory. Men kill for wealth, men kill for territory to expand the domain of their nation, of the domain of their powers. That's not as great a crime as the suppression, holding down, holding back, denying the potential that God put in man for his dignity, for his freedom, for his function as a total creature on this earth. For surely that kind of persecution is worse than outright slaughter. So we are happy to see better days in America. We are happy to see better days in the world. But we are not going to be so foolish or so naive to overlook the evils, the serious evils that continue 
the subtle oppression, the subtle evils that continue to work the undermining of the freedom of the common person. It is not altogether our fault that we are spending the wealth of our African American community on quick pleasures, on self-destruction, on getting high, et cetera, et cetera, on image that's shallow, silly fads, silly hairdos, silly dress styles. Many of the youngsters, I see them now, they are wearing the popular dunce cap, and they don't even know that's the name of it. But they are wearing it all over the United States. They're wearing the dunce cap. It's not all our fault that we are spending the great resources of our African-American people on these temporary and passing away things. I won't go into any details to put any particular quarter of our society or personalities in our society on the spot today. The purpose here today is really to reconcile our own life and to make peace in America so that can be a real success, not only for now, but for the generations to come. But before going further into our talk of our own situation, for which we are getting help, there are efforts by people like Reverend Fontroy in Washington, his colleagues, his associates, and many others, even J. A. Johnson of the Johnson Publication, he recently said, and it was published in our paper, the American Muslim Journal, a paper that is shaping up day by day and week by week and month by month to be the paper we want it to be. It was given in our paper that the Mr. Johnson, in a reason address, addressing an audience of distinguished persons, he said, we are going to have to mobilize the spirit of our people. And I agree with that, and I'm happy to know that we are not alone. We are not alone in recognizing the spiritual poverty of our race. It's not enough to feel good about God on the weekend or to extend your hand to a pitiful person occasionally and go down the path of suicide, suicidal behavior and see your whole race almost following you or going that, in that direction toward behavioral, behavioral suicide. And leaving the great aims and great purposes, the great virtues, the great principles, the great liberation virtues. Don't you know the struggle of our people from slavery? The efforts of our people even during slavery and those efforts, as we saw them continued or carried on by freed ancestors, freed blacks, or African Americans, and joined by so many whites, Jews, because there were liberation virtues. There was a spirit, but not only a spirit, there was principles. And the old folks used to tell us, I can't let you behave that way. You have to be a decent person. And they insisted that we be decent because they were in a spirit for their liberation and they knew liberation wouldn't come without virtues. In order to win freedom in a country of Christians, in a country that sought excellence and a people that sought great excellence, 
Our downcast people knew that they would have to live in accordance with the best of their spirit, in accordance with the best of their morality, in accordance with the best of their mind and principles to be successful in that uphill road, in that uphill road, that very painful and painful, steep road to equality and justice in the United States of America. They didn't give up and they were successful because the free people seeing the oppressed struggling in that spirit and struggling in the dress of their God-given virtues was impressed and they believed in the innocent and noble motives of the struggling African American. But something has happened. Something has happened. Something took place in the 60s. Something took place in the 70s. Something has robbed us of that spirit and something has made us abandon those virtues. Now let me continue my reflection on the word of God as given to Muslims in our holy book, the Quran. In an effort to present our religion very briefly and very quickly to those who are not acquainted with it, because we want our American brothers and sisters, our American citizens that we have to live with, that we have to find peace and settlement among, that we have to work with to realize a great future for ourselves in this country. We want them to know us. We want them to feel comfortable with us. There are many different kinds of Muslims. There's the orthodox Muslim and the unorthodox Muslim. There's the proper Muslim and the notorious Muslim. There's the sane Muslim and the insane Muslim. There are many different kinds of Muslims. But believe me, the Muslim that's before you now is not ashamed. I'm not ashamed no matter where I stand, no matter where I go. I'm never ashamed. The African Americans life, the African Americans group spirit, the African Americans group form, the African American group identity has never been established, right or wrong. Has never been established. And that's why you feel so lonesome. That's why you feel so lost. That's why you feel so depressed. That's why you feel you're not yet there. With all of this material affluence all around you, cut up TVs, wealth piling up over your head, you have to push through the wealth sometimes to get through, uh, to the washroom. With all of that in your life, with all of your degrees, PH degree in this, math degrees in that, BS degrees in that, with all of that, you still feel lost. You still feel short of the mark of arriving at home simply because we have not retreated. Step back from the white man and say, look, you've led us far as you can take us. Now we're going to build an ideology. Now we're going to build a philosophy, a philosophy of life for the African-American man. And you can't help us stand aside and watch us do it. And if we want you, we will call on you. Don't you know in your soul that that's the work that's yet to be done? And once you have your true evaluation, you just can't treat yourself like you're a dog or an inferior thing. No, you can't do that. You respect yourself. When you get true evaluation of the self, the high self that God made when he made a human being, then you will be careful not to mistreat yourself. That was another thing Mr. Farad said, no self. Know yourself. And he didn't say yourself as a black man. He said, it, he, asked, he gave us a kind of catechism, like they give the, like the Catholic Church has. He said, and who, 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 who is my own self? What is my own self? Then he gives the answer, like a catechism. 
my own self is a righteous Muslim. So he told us to identify ourselves as Muslim. Now, after studying this religion over many years now, since I became aware of what Mr. Farad taught us, because my mother had me memorize those things, not just me, the Muslim sisters, the grown up, had, had themselves and their children memorize those things. You had to commit it to memory, know it by heart, that's what we used to say, by heart, know it by heart. So anyway, since then, I have studied it. And in Islam, in the Quran and in the teachings of, of Muhammad, prayers and peace be upon him, we have two definitions for Muslim. Or if I was writing a dictionary, I would put two entries for Muslim. First entry would be believers in God and believers in Muhammad as the last prophet with the final revelation, the Quran. Uh, that's just short. That's, uh, that'd be a short, uh, the short entry for that num entry number one. What would be the second one? Muslim, the original unspoiled nature of every human being. The first Adam, the first un and unspoiled, the original, the first, and the unspoiled nature of every human being. And I guess the Christians are saying the same thing when they say, Christ in you, Christ the prophet, or the Messiah prophet, and Christ in every person. Because Jesus Christ is the one who told them to say that, according to the gospel. Christ said, I in you, and you in me, meaning that we both are having the same essence. Our human essence is one, but my spirit is different from yours. His spirit was from God, but his flesh was the same as our flesh. And he said, I and you and you and me. But I'm sure he was not identifying all of us in our present makeup, in our present mental and spiritual makeup, in our present spiritual and mental makeup over 90% of us are not true human. We are not true descendants of Adam, meaning that we are in the true human nature that God created. We are not in it. We have been taken out of that original nature that God put us, that God made for us when he made our father, Adam. We have been taken out of it. And we know that the story of Adam is that he was seduced to come out of his nature. So he lost his nature too, to the several words of the Satan when he was whispering into his soul, into Adam's soul, Adam's soul. And he sold Adam on a, a different mind for his life. He sold Adam a different mind for his life. God had created him with a right mind, and then the Satan sold him on a different mind and caused him to fall from the high place that God had put him in when he made him. The fall of man, the fall of mankind. Though we have preachers preaching scripture, most of us are not in our true human form. If we were, we would be doing better with our human life. 